Good. So um, the theme that I thought I would share with you guys today is positive intelligence. Uh, and this is a program that I did some training in a couple of years ago, and it's relatively new. It's come out of Stanford University. Um, and I'll show you the, the founder <laughs> in a moment. Um, and it might be interesting. Oh, I guess Lorna dropped out, I think. But um, it's actually was kind of shared with the intention of um, helping coaches and people to, to share it with their clients of, within their own practice. Um, and so that's quite interesting possibly for Lorna, but um, let's see if I can get the things to change. There we go. Um, so that's Shirzad Charmin is the man who kind of put together this program. And um, it's come through a lot of research um, where they've looked at brain scans and kind of how the brain works. And one of the things that he was interested in in particular is kind of what happens in the brain during mindfulness um, that makes it so impactful. And so he, looking at that along with some other data, um, and, and trying to say like, what are the concrete things that we can, that we know actually help us to have a healthier mindset, healthier brain, um, more positive intelligence, if you want. Um, and so there are three components to the program that he's put together. And one part of it is they've, they've put together a way to kind of measure what he calls your positive intelligence quotient. And so on the website, um, which is linked there and that you should be able to access from, um, the resources after uh, they actually have kind of a free survey that you can do the, the positive intelligence quotient kind of test to, to test your own PQ at the moment. Um, and the idea that it is not something that's static, right? It's changing all the time. Um, and, and so the way that he talks about the brain is kind of like a muscle essentially. And so part of what we will look at today are kind of how we exercise our brain so that our positive intelligence quotient is as high as possible. Um, and so, you know, you can do this kind of assessment and notice, you know, is this a time where my kind of mental resources are a bit low? Is it a time where I'm doing really well and thriving? Um, and so PQ, what they've, what they've seen is that it's actually a much better predictor for how happy you are and how well you perform in relation to your potential then IQ, then EQ, then a lot of the other things that we've used more traditionally. So it kind of puts together a lot of elements of those different things um, into what I find to be actually a really practical kind of way that we can individually look at how to help ourselves. Um, and so that's one of the things that I've really liked about using it. Um, and I've been using it in schools. Um, we've done some trainings with teachers. Um, I've used it in classes of students um, and shared it with students. I've used it in counseling sessions with clients, both children and adults, um, and have largely had really positive feedback. Um, but then also in my personal life, I found it really helpful. So um, I thought it might be a nice little concrete thing that I could share with you guys today. Um, and so, as I said, there's kind of three pieces to the program that Shirzad put together. And the first one is what he calls weakening your saboteurs. And the idea is that, um, and you've seen this in different psychology, there's a lot of different ways of language around this concept, essentially. Um, but you might think of the saboteurs as kind of habits, mental habits that we have, um, coping strategies or defense mechanisms. Um, and so he says that there are 10 saboteurs and that during our childhood and development, we learn to rely on certain saboteurs that are useful to us depending on what types of situations we find ourselves in. Um, and so I'll show you a list of those in a moment. But the idea is, is that as we become adults, there are certain saboteurs or kind of unhealthy mental habits that we've developed that we continue to rely on out of habit, even though they don't necessarily serve us in our current realities. Um, and so the first step is being able to kind of identify which saboteurs are most common in our own habits, to name them, and to then choose to kind of respond differently to the situations that we face. Um, so that's part one. Um, the second part is empowering your sage. And so the sage brain is really, when he talks about that, he's talking about the frontal lobe. Um, and so, you know, I think all of us here are connected to well being in some way. And so, probably you see this come out in a lot of the well being practices and, and different research as well. Um, but executive functioning in the frontal lobe, when we are using that part of our brain to the fullest, 
It's when we are able to make the best decisions to evaluate things well, to use all the different experiences and knowledge that we have um, to really be our true selves and to be our most effective in the world. Um, but what tends to happen is that when we experience threat of some kind, our brain jumps back into the amygdala, kind of into the emotional center of the brain, and we go into fight, flight, or freeze mode, right? And we're probably all a little bit familiar with that too. Um, and so when we're operating out of fight, flight, or freeze mode, which he calls, again, kind of your saboteur brain, um, we are not using the frontal lobe. Um, and actually what you can see in brain scans is that when we're under threat, the, the executive function part of the brain goes down to about 20% functionality. So, you know, even if we think most of the time we're really good at things and we're effective at what we're doing, when we're under extreme stress or anxiety, if we're under threat of some kind and our brain kind of flips that switch and we go into fight, flight, or freeze mode, we are not gonna be thinking as clearly, we'll have a hard time focusing, um, all kinds of different ways that our normal capacities get reduced. Um, and those threats can include lack of sleep, um, you know, any way that our brain is experiencing that it's not getting what it needs or that it's in danger of some kind um, can trigger us going into this kind of saboteur brain um, or fight, flight, freeze mode. And so the idea is, is that we can actually practice building up the neural connections to empower our sage brain, which is really using that frontal lobe um, and helping our brain reset out of fight, flight, or freeze mode and move more quickly back into the frontal lobe and, and using our full critical thinking skills. Um, and the third step is how you do that. How do you build up those neural pathways so that your brain moves more naturally into sage mode instead of saboteur mode? Um, and in positive intelligence, they call that the self-command muscle. Um, and so we're not really physically talking about muscles here. Um, they're really neural connections. Um, but I think the muscle analogy works really well because really the idea is that with these exercises that I'm gonna get us to practice here in a second is it's like when you go to the gym, if you are doing arm curls, every time that you curl your arm with a weight, you are building up your bicep. It rips apart a little bit and builds back stronger and the muscle grows. Um, and so the idea is that, that, that there are these mental exercises that we can do that have the same impact on our, on our neural pathways. Um, and we can strengthen the neural connections that help our brain to reconnect to the frontal lobe and to use that um, as effectively as possible. So that's kind of the background and a very brief summary version of how it all fits together. Um, the main thing we're gonna focus on is that third piece, which is the self-command, building up your mental control. Um, and obviously they're all important together, but that one I think is really useful to share. And it's something that we can all take away and practice straight away. Um, so I thought what we'll do actually is, I'll just let you guys, practice that first um, and then we'll go into a little bit more depth of some of the other things and then we can just have some time to to share together and discuss if that's okay um, so what i would suggest is if you just take a moment to be aware of your body and how you're sitting um, to get comfortable if possible to put your feet flat on the floor you can choose to close your eyes or not. Um, it's, easy, it's easier sometimes to just watch the visual cues as well. Um, but if you, if you feel comfortable, feel free to close your eyes. Um, you will notice these little exercises that we're gonna do, which in the program, they call them PQ reps. So repetitions of um, PQs. And they're taken from mindfulness, but they're condensed into little 10 second exercises. Um, and the idea here is not to maintain your attention consistently for an extended period of time, um, but to continuously be redirecting your attention back to a particular place. And so each time that you direct your attention, it's like lifting a weight. It's like doing one of those arm curls and building up that muscle a little bit. Um, and so in this context, getting distracted, having random thoughts, which is totally human and it happens to all of us, even if we're trying to meditate or do mindfulness. Um, each distraction is actually an opportunity to build up that muscle a little bit more. Um, and so particularly with young people, I find that really helpful. Um, I don't 
using mindfulness with teens, for example, I hear a lot of times from people that, um, oh gosh, I can't, I can't concentrate or oh, I can't focus that long. Um, but this is a really practical little 10 second movements of the, of, of the attention. Um, and I find that it's a lot easier for them to, to give it a chance to open, to be open to it in the beginning. Um, so with that being said, we're gonna start just by taking finger and thumb and just rub your finger against your thumb with enough pressure to feel the lines of your fingerprint on the tip of your finger. And you're just gonna focus your attention on the feeling of those lines, those lines that make each one of us unique. Just notice the texture. Now we're gonna take the fingers on one hand and rub them gently against the fingers and palm of your other hand. And again, just moving your attention to the sensation of your fingers moving across your skin. And each time you get distracted or you have a thought, it's totally okay. You're just gonna gently redirect your attention to that sensation on your hand. And now if you move your attention to your toes, we're just gonna notice each of our toes individually. Try to find each of your probably 10 toes. You can wiggle them around a little bit and just notice each one separately. And now if you gently guide your attention to your hearing and just listen out into the space you're in and find the sound that you can hear that's furthest away from you. And again, as you have thoughts or get distracted, just gently redirect your attention back to that sound that you can hear that's furthest away from you. And now move your attention to a sound that you can hear that's closest to you. Something in the room, it might be the sound of your own breathing. And finally, we're gonna bring our attention to our breath. And just notice the temperature of the air as you breathe in and the temperature of the air as you breathe out. And as you're ready, you can just let your attention come back into our Zoom space. Does anybody wanna share a feeling or an observation that you have from that time? Something you noticed in your body or simplicity's sake. Um, the idea here is, is that when we experience an event or we come face to face with a situation or a decision, right? Um, we basically have kind of two pathways that our brain can go. And one is towards the saboteur brain, right? Which we can kind of relate to that fight flight or freeze mode. Um, the other is towards the sage brain, which is really the, the frontal lobe, right? And the, the cortex. So the idea is, is that doing these little PQ exercises where you are just repeatedly directing your attention towards a sensory input, right? And so you'll notice all the exercises we did are connecting us to one of our senses in some way. Um, and, and what that does is it focuses the attention of our brain on the here and now on the present moment. 
just like mindfulness does. Um, and what's really cool about when we do that is that it actually helps our brain to realize that right here in this moment, I'm not under threat. There's nothing that is attacking me in this moment. Um, and most of us can relate to the fact that probably the majority of the threats that we face in our modern day world are either traumatic or upsetting memories from the past, or they are worries, anxieties about the future, things that may or may not happen in front of us, right? Um, most of us are most of the time not in direct real threat in this present moment where we are. Um, but our brains are, are trained through evolution over thousands of years to be hypersensitive to threat. And so particularly in these contexts during the pandemic, for example, where we are surrounded by messages of worry and risk and all of these types of things, right? It's not surprising that for a lot of us, we find ourselves you know, under extreme stress for extended periods of time, um, lots of feelings and thoughts of anxiety. And so our brain is probably spending a lot of time towards that saboteur path, right? Feeling like it's under threat. And so these PQ exercises, one of the things they help us do is to build up that pathway to move the brain back towards the, the direction of the sage. Um, and by bringing our, our focus to the present moment and realizing we're not under attack right now. Um, and, and our brain is able to reset and go back into using that full executive functioning in the frontal lobe. Um, and so like with everything else, right? The more that you exercise that pathway, the easier it is for the brain to use those neural connections, right? They get bigger and stronger the more they get used. And the less frequently that we're using the pathway towards the saboteur brain, the weaker that those connections get. And so our brain will be less likely to move immediately into that fight, flight, or freeze response, especially when it's not really the response that we need, right? Because the reality is if we're freaking out about a math test at the end of the week, like it doesn't help us to be in fight, flight, or freeze mode. It's not gonna be an effective way to deal with that situation. It might feel like a threat, but actually what we need is our full frontal lobe executive skills capacity to face that threat well. It's not the same as having a lion in front of you right now where we just need to run away. Um, so, so building up that pathway and allowing our brain to kind of give us that space to make the choice to use all of the skills and resources that we have um, to the best of our ability in that moment. Um, so, so that's kind of the idea behind these little exercises. And what they've seen um, looking at brain scans is that if you practice these little 10 second exercises for about two minutes, four to five times a day over a period of six weeks, they can see significant change in the neural pathways in the brain. Um, and so that's quite interesting and quite concrete um, is that with a very minimal kind of commitment and effort, um, you can see significant change in the way that your brain works. And the other thing that I really like about these exercises is that you can take them with you everywhere and do them in almost any setting. And, and one of the things that they talk about in positive intelligence is that actually um, it's really helpful to practice these exercises in a lot of different settings. You can do it in a business meeting. You can do it in the hallway at school, even if you're surrounded by your friends and nobody has to know you're doing it. Um, but one of the issues with mindfulness is that most people maybe have their quiet space in the morning or wherever it might be, and you take time out from your life and you get calm and you reflect, and that has benefits and it's excellent. But it doesn't always translate for people into a moment of stress when they're maybe, you know, in in that test or whatever it might be, it's not natural for them to apply those same habits. And we know that our brain definitely learns contextually. And so these little exercises you can take with you into almost any setting, you can practice them in different environments. And that makes it that much easier for your brain to apply that habit in a load of different circumstances. So it's not just if I'm in this safe space that I can calm myself down, but I can actually practice doing that in almost any situation. Um, and so it makes it really portable and practical, practical um, which, which I've found particularly helpful for teenagers um, as well, who, like I said, sometimes struggle with the idea of doing longer mindfulness exercises. Um, so 
I think that was the main bit of what I wanted to share with you guys today. There's more information around the saboteurs and those other pieces, um, which you know I'm happy to talk more about if people have questions or if you're interested. Um, but the the PQ repetitions that that was the the main practice that that I thought would be useful. And like I say, you know, um, teachers have found that really helpful. It's something that you can do yourself, but that it's really easy to teach your class as well. And you can use it in different moments um, and, and incorporate it into lots of different types of activities or things that you do without spending a lot of time or energy. Um, so um, in that sense, I found it very valuable.